Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. Episode 1, The Anachron Campaign. This is a read-through of the book series Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare, as read by the author, D.S. Pope. All character graphics were created by the author from the website heroofmachine.com. Sound effects are downloaded from soundbabble.com. Background music has been composed by Kevin MacLeod at Encompatech.com. I do all of this work for free. My videos are not monetized. If you wish to support my work, please purchase the original book on Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box. To all who have had the courage to serve, an open letter and an introduction to the Slender Dragon Eye book series. May you serve with the same honor and devotion as the Garden Knights of Gapolonia. Let your jewel sergeants mysteriously materialize directly behind you and proceed to educate your sorry asses. The soldier is the army. No army is better than the soldiers. The soldier is also a citizen. In fact, the highest obligation and privilege of citizenship is that of bearing arms for one's country. Hence, it is a proud privilege to be a soldier, a good soldier. Anyone, in any walk of life, who is content with mediocrity is untrue to himself and true American tradition. To be a good soldier, a man must have discipline, self-respect, pride in his unit and in his country, and a high sense of duty and obligation to his comrades and to his superiors, and self-confidence born of demonstrated ability. George S. Patton Jr., or as I knew it. It is extremely tempting to suggest, in a thorough reading of classical accounts of historical battles, that all soldiers throughout history are the same. The psychological principle of projection is ever present when reading an exceptionally well-written work of literature, wherein the reader places himself or herself into the scene and transforms himself into one of the characters taking part in the action. A young soldier, or a family member of a young soldier, while reading the book series like Sludge and Dragon Eye in order to comprehend certain aspects of the psychology of warfare, would have a tendency to think that the young soldiers described therein share the same values, beliefs, and motivations that the reader does. This is most certainly not the case. During my undergrad coursework at the University of Arkansas Fort Smith, I and my other fledgling historical researchers were warned about the dangers of evaluating historical claims based upon our own present day viewpoints or biases. As difficult as the process may be, our professors drilled into our heads the overwhelming importance of evaluating historical claims from the viewpoint of the people who lived through it. The study of warfare is no different. It is here that my dear readers would have some reason to pause and reflect. After all, you might remind me, I'm a military veteran myself, having served as a tanker in the United States Army and a fire patrolman in the Navy. Well, certainly this would give me all the experiences and perspectives that I would need in order to understand absolutely bloody everything about military service. Further, my frequent overseas tours, my deployment to the Persian Gulf in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, ought to provide me all the information that I need to complete a book series of this caliber. Surprisingly enough, it is not. Certainly, I can tell you what happens to a young soldier when he joins the military, completes basic training, reports for, to his first command, and deploys it overseas. I can tell you what it is like to serve one's country, sometimes in a foreign location, thousands of miles away from home, to be separated from one's family and friends for months or even years at a time, and indeed what it is like to transition back to civilian life after the fact. So what need is there for me to study military history? A few weeks ago, as of the time of this writing, I had the opportunity to meet a rather notable military historian, Dr. John C. McManus, PhD. I have subsequently read the two books that he had immediately available at the event, the dead and those who are about to die, and hell before their very eyes. As I explained to Dr. McManus, I am a fantasy fiction novelist, and therefore enjoy the wonderful privilege of simply being able to make stuff up as I go along, and my dear readers will never be wise to my little scheme. 
but I would be dissatisfied with that. I read works of history such as his, I told him, to, in order to gain both inspiration and perspective. But therein lies another problem. In my research of history in general and military history in particular, I have noticed that most works of literature fall into one of two distinct categories. Either they are well researched but poorly written, or they are well written but poorly researched. And sadly, some are both poorly written and poorly researched, hence are not worth the time taken to walk to the local library to investigate whether they have such sorry shite in fist in their shelves. But a few authors do in fact rise above the din, in the respect that their books are both well written and well researched. John C. McManus I have mentioned. I would add to the short list Stephen E. Ambrose, Band of Brothers, Bernard Cornwall, Waterloo, and Douglas Fermer, Sedan, 1870, The Clips of France. I ought to include, at least by way of honorable mention, such books as The Guns of August, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and Sailors to the End. Consider the book The Face of Battle, itself a sort of a meta-example of a book that is thoroughly researched but is as sleep-inducing as a university-level history textbook. The late John Keegan, noted professor of history at the Military Academy at Sandhurst, highlighted the phenomenon thusly. Imagination and sentiment, which quite properly delimit the dimensions of the novelist's realm, are a dangerous medium, however, to which to approach the subject of battle. Historians, traditionally and rightly, are expected to ride their feelings on a tighter rein than the man of letters can allow himself. One school of historians, at least, the compilers of the British official history of the First World War, have achieved the remarkable feat of writing an exhaustive account of one of the world's greatest tragedies without the display of any emotion at all. But if we may conclude that the official historian's decision to deal with the emotive difficulty in military historiography by denying themselves any explicit emotional output whatsoever was unsatisfactory, and that some exploration of the combatants' emotions, if not indulgence of our own, is essential to the truthful writing of military history, we are left with the problem of how it is to be done. I know it's riveting stuff. But that is the entire problem. I am seeking through the Slender Dragon Eye series to reveal to my dear readers what military service is actually like based upon the experiences of those who lived through it and hopefully in a way that is compelling and interesting to read. All of this will be framed in the type of epic fantasy fiction tale that I've always wanted to write ever since I read C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia as a young teenager. Some parts will be humorous, some parts sad, some parts exciting, and some parts dull. Some will make you mad, and some parts will make you think. Some parts are exaggerated beyond the scope of all reason. Other parts only appear to be exaggerated, but are shockingly based upon real-life events. Make of that what you will. Leaving then our erstwhile subject of stylistic writing and the need to present massive quantities of information in a way that is engaging and affecting on part of the reader, we proceed to the question of why soldiers choose to join the military in the first place. Why would a person willingly subject himself or herself to the personal hardships inherent in military training, family separation, the danger of serious injury, and the possibility of killing another person or being killed in the process? Well, that last comment simply begs the question that soldiers have always willingly chosen to go to war. Today's soldiers, at least in the United States and a select few other advanced First World nations, serve in all volunteer military forces, engaged via private contract, in a specified capacity for a specified period of time. But this is a relatively recent phenomenon. Throughout most of human history, a private soldier served in the military not because he wanted to, but because he was compelled to, under pain of death, imprisonment, confiscation of titles or property, or at the very least public shaming and banishment due to charges of cowardice. Historically, military service tended to follow the pattern described below. A ruler or general, for reasons and motivations that are never adequately explained, decides to start a military campaign against his neighbor. In order to wage this war, he needs to build an army, 
usually consist of massive numbers of heavily armed though barely trained troops who will be capable of boarding the ship, landing on foreign shores, brave illness, injury, and death, all of that before the battle has even started, and with bugger all guarantee that the soldiers involved will ever make it back home. To build such an army, the king institutes some form of conscription, beginning with a small cadre of professional soldiers who become the equivalent of senior sergeants, and the knights and noblemen who become the officers. A large mass of humanity is legally coerced, compelled at sword point, or cajoled by a small monetary bounty to report to the recruiting officers. Many times, as recently as the 19th century in Europe, Noblemen or large estate landowners were given a certain quota of bodies that they had to send, either among the nobleman's family or among the serfs working in the field. They also had to provide food and material support, often in addition to the heavy taxation required to finance the military campaign. Private soldiers, enlisted to serve in the campaign, might have been ranks and marched off to war, with little idea as to why they were marching, where they were marching to, or what they were supposed to do once they reached their destination beyond the scant information offered by the noblemen in command of them. So perhaps then we ought to frame the question thusly, why would a modern soldier choose to serve in an all volunteer military? The reasons of course are as myriad as the soldiers themselves. But to explore the answer, one must dispense with the nonsensical propaganda that people join the military out of a sense of pure patriotism or nationalism. That may be the excuse that politicians give, the same folks, of course, who never have the courage to serve in combat but would not hesitate to send others, but such a sentiment does not come within a rifle range's distance from reality. If you were to ask the average soldier why he or she is elected to serve in uniform, you would receive a wide variety of responses. Some serve out of a sense of duty, to be fair. Sometimes it is out of family pride in the sense of my father, grandfather, uncle, cousin, brother, or sister has joined the insert branch of service or war here, and now it's my turn. Some others are simply bored with their lives, and for want of anything better to do, they join the military in order to expand their horizons and prove their mettle. Other people join for the professional training and intend to use their military experiences to help them get their foot in the door in the post-service career fields of their own choosing. Still others have political goals. As one good friend of mine and the original subject of this open letter very well knows, if he wants to make any headway at all in the local political scene, then a DD-214 with the phrase honorable discharge at the bottom will certainly get the voters' attention. But I should give him fair warning. Anything less than a proper honorable discharge, especially the three lowest types, of an honorable big chicken dinner or dishonorable discharge would cause the voters to forget his name five minutes after they learn it. That having been said, I'm not altogether worried about the soldier in question as he is college educated and appears to have a square head on his shoulders. But he is naive, and that naivety would prove to be a death sentence of an otherwise promising military career. In any case, I ought to discuss the most important reason why people join the military, the biggest reason that secretly motivates all soldiers, whether they care to admit it or not. Money. Like it or not, the military is a fantastic career choice for young adults. They will work harder than they ever will, no matter what they end up doing in their civilian lives. They will suffer bruises, blistered feet, weary bones, sleep deprivation, and the overwhelming sense that they ought to just quit but enough about the Manchu Mile Road March. For all the hardships that our young soldiers face, they are indeed well compensated for their efforts. I can even admit that I initially joined the army to receive the GI Bill in order to pay for college, and this is the only reason why I have a university degree today. Pay as an incentive for military service is, in fact, as old as the military service itself. In the book Agincourt, about the 1415 military campaign of the same name, author Christopher Hibbert was kind enough to list the breakdown of pay for noblemen, knights, archers, as well as George V's entire retinue of personal assistants, cooks, horse handlers, and pages. Consider also the traditional English song dating back to at least the 1700s, though it existed as a folk melody long before that, over the hills and far away. There's 20 shillings on the drum for him that with us freely comes. 
Tis volunteer shall win the day over the hills and far away. So the pay and benefits are not too bad, at least compared to what some soldiers would be making in the civilian sector. It's why paratroopers jump out of perfectly good airplanes. It's why sailors come aboard floating metal boxes and sail them into the middle of the ocean. It's why I was willing to freeze my tail off while sailing guard duty on the tank line in South Korea. It is the answer to why a soldier willingly subjects himself or herself to the dirt underneath the fingernails, the scraping of the elbows, the head bowed down to avoid the sandstorm, the helicopter flying in to rescue the flood victims, and the helmet dragged through the mud, reality of daily life in the military. As we chart our course to the seas of time, and we examine the progression of changes in military life, we see that the sticks and stones give way to battle axes, which give way to swords and shields, which give way to bows and arrows, which give way to cannonballs, which give way to heavy caliber siege guns, which give way to rockets and missiles, which give way to nuclear bombs, which revert back to rockets and missiles, because nuclear weapons were a step further than humanity wanted to go. We ask ourselves then, the question that every would-be military historian attempts to answer, is there a common thread? Is there some ethereal tie that binds a modern professional volunteer soldier to the sword wielding serf that was his ancient forebearer in the deep, murky, and nigh forgotten waters of history? I believe, in fact, that there are two. The first is the military leader. By a leader, at least in this sense, I'm not referring to the star strewn general sitting in his nice, comfortable tent, studying a map and viewing the battle from afar. I'm talking about the true leader, the one on the scene, leading from the front, subjecting himself to fire from the enemy in order to motivate his troops. The modern Wellington, astride a new version of the horse Copenhagen, leading his troops in the latest rendition of Waterloo. But what does it take to be such a leader? This person need not be an officer per se, as even a lowly private can rally his fellow privates and give them orders as best he can until a higher ranked soldier happens by. But in the instant case, examine the actions of Colonel George Taylor, commanding officer of the 16th Infantry Regiment at Omaha Beach on D-Day. Arriving at the living hell that was Omaha, he saw to his everlasting dismay that most of his soldiers, living, wounded, or dead, were crouching behind a low shell cliff, engineering obstacles, or even burned out army vehicles. Colonel Taylor, who apparently was still recovering from a surgical procedure and with his testicles replaced by 12 pound bowling balls, charged forth through the withering fire of machine gun nests, 88 millimeter guns, and artillery shells slamming down all around him. He ran back and forth across the beach from one pinned down and frightened group of soldiers to the next urging them to continue forward with the following speech. There are only two types of soldiers left on the speech, the dead and those who are about to die. Now get up and keep moving. On the other end of the Normandy battlefield, Lieutenant Dick Winters of EC Company 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, the unit made famous by Band of Brothers, saw at least three German artillery pieces raining fire upon his fellow soldiers at Utah Beach. Gathering together as many members of the 101st Airborne Division as he could find, he led them into the fray in a systematic attack on the German gun nests. After dispatching the defenders to whatever version of the afterlife that they happened to believe in, he then destroyed the guns with a combination of TNT blocks and the Germans' own potato masher grenades. For his actions, Lieutenant, later Major, Dick Winters was rewarded the Distinguished Service Cross. The second commonality, the second tie that binds the modern soldier to the dusty bones and rusty armor laid to rest in ancient burial sites, is the following rather curious observation. Despite any other claims that are made, wars are not won by the carefully constructed logistical plans of the generals who, despite the heroic actions described in the past two paragraphs, are still sitting in their command posts viewing the battle from afar. As a matter of fact, Field Marshal Helmut von Mulkey, the Elder, in describing the wars of German unification, stated, No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Or, as I like to say it, the only thing that you could ever plan is that nothing will ever go according to plan. Indeed, 
General Patton seemed to be well aware of this phenomenon, and in fact used it to his advantage. As Patton famously advised, never tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do, and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. Wars are instead won by the extraordinary actions of the soldier on the battlefield, with only the vaguest concept of what the objective is, and little concept of how to achieve it, the soldier is given an impossible task, under impossible circumstances, and then proceeds to make the impossible possible. Quite often, he or she does so in a rather surprising and unorthodox manner that bears only a passing resemblance to the original plan and puts to test all current assumptions as to the limits of human endurance. This is why the Marines at Guadalcanal inspire me, for reasons that have almost nothing to do with the fact that I served on the ship that was named after their general. In August 1942, they engaged in the first of many island hopping battles that formed the bulk of the ground action in the Pacific Theater of World War II. During the initial amphibious assault, Major General Alexander Vandergrift commander of the 1st Marine Division and eventual commandant of the Marine Corps, decided that, in order to save space on the amphibious vessels and provide a faster and more efficient assault, his Marines would only pack enough food, water, ammunition, and supplies to last for two or three days. The concept was that, after the beach was secured, they could establish a clear landing zone and fly into the rest of the gear that they needed. What he could not foresee was the decision of Admiral Turner who needed all available ships and aircraft to protect the fleet from attack. This left the marines on the beach with a lurch. The only way that they survived the battle was to use any extraneous food, ammunition, and equipment that our Japanese friends left behind when they abandoned their positions. Never, ever, ever underestimate the sheer tenacity of our Marine Corps brethren. The food that the Japanese soldiers had abandoned was magnificent rice. With that, and precious little fresh water, our Marines continued the fight until it was won. General Vandergriff commented afterwards. Striking from the sea, they assaulted and conquered a series of organized positions, defended in great strength by a wily and determined opponent. The fight was carried to the enemy at all times and in all places, and he was driven from every place he held by the resolute attack of men who were not afraid to die. God favors the bold and strong of heart. These are the actions that win wars. A bit more specifically, it takes the hard work and dedication of each individual soldier performing his or her duties to the very best of his ability in concert with all the other soldiers in the command performing their duties for the unit as a whole to accomplish its mission. For the want of total commitment of any individual soldier, the battlefield effectiveness of the entire command will suffer. On a final note, I want to discuss a concept of leadership that most authors tend to gloss over that is most thoroughly demotivating, hence it is not good inspirational fodder for the average self-help book. I want to talk about the subject of failure. This is important is the fear of failure paralyzes a person in a high-stress situation, particularly in combat operations, when the lives of other people around him are at stake. The young soldier, new to the military, might as well disabuse of himself of one overwhelmingly important concept, that being that leaders never fail. Face the facts. You are going to fail. In fact, you are going to fail spectacularly. It is safe to assume that those who have never failed at anything are those who have never tried anything difficult. It is those with the pure unmitigated temerity to charge towards the enemy with both horns lowered and a snarl on their snouts that will most likely find themselves knocked back down onto their haunches, often in mid-stride. A person of lesser moral integrity will continue to sit there in the mud, make excuses about why they fail, or try to lay the blame on other people. But a person of courage shakes off the hit, stands back up, and plans another charge. Perhaps you can take a different path up the hill. Perhaps you can maneuver around the enemy and surround him with a flank attack. Or perhaps, for lack of any better options, you can 
Just lower your horns, let out a snort, kick up the dirt beneath their hooves, and keep running. Take the infamous charge of the Light Brigade. From the Battle of Balaclava to the Crimean War of 1854. Major General James Budenhill, Earl of Cardigan, was supposed to move his brigade to the side of the battlefield in order to intercept a battery of Russian artillery guns that were being repositioned closer to the British lines. Captain Nolan, Lieutenant General Raglan's aide de camp, was supposed to deliver this message, but instead he apparently told General Cardigan to charge straight down the center of the valley. He did so, and the onslaught of artillery shells raining down all around him caused an astonishing 40% casualty rate. It was the worst military blunder since Napoleon decided it would be a fantastic idea to try to invade Moscow in the dead of winter, and it remained the worst military blunder until Hitler decided it would be a fantastic idea to try to invade Moscow in the dead of winter. And yet, Partly because he had a good publicist, but mostly because he looked fabulous in a smart little uniform, he received a hero's welcome upon his return to Britain, and this is the reason why cardigan sweaters are still considered fashionable. I exaggerate, of course. General Samsonov's actions in the Battle of Tannenberg, August 1914, were much worse by any stretch of the imagination. Tannenberg, in fact, stands as a textbook example of the need for communication security or ComSec. After all, what better method could Russia use on the Eastern Front of World War I than to practically broadcast all of their army's positions over wireless telegraphy, hoping to the heavens that the Germans would not bother to listen in and take notes? This little mistake caused 92,000 casualties and 78,000 prisoners of war. Come to think of it, that was the worst blunder of military history. Even worse than getting involved in a land war in Asia. So to my newly minted fellow warriors, I offer the usual fare. Don't take any wooden nickels, watch each other's backs, insert third point this platitude here. And of course, if you've learned bugger all else from this open letter, or from the Slender Dragon Eye book series that will eventually follow it, then remember this. Never, ever, ever attempt to evade Moscow in the dead of winter. Good luck to each and every one of you, and thanks for taking the time to read this. Now go field day your various rooms! Art now the drums beat up again, for all true soldier gentlemen. So let us list and march, I say and go over the hills and far away. Over the hills and over the main, to Flanders, Portugal, and Spain. Queen Anne commands and will obey, and go over the hills and far away. That concludes this segment of The Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, we find out what happens when a half prime blacksmith goes into business for himself. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box.